Washington Journal continues. At the table now, Melanie Sloan, Executive Director of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics. CREW is the uh, right. acronym there. Wanted to talk to you about congressional ethics and uh, earmarks. There's several stories in the paper today, but wanted to first get an update on something that was created a couple of years ago, which we talked about then. Want to get an update now. It's the Office of Congressional Ethics. Uh, how was it first formed, and how has it been operating? Well, it was formed as part of a campaign promise that Nancy Pelosi made when the Democrats were campaigning on the issue of the culture of corruption and they were going to fix things. And the House Ethics Committee was considered broken at that time, uh, and, and it still is broken. And so the Office of Congressional mm -hmm. Ethics was created uh, as a new body that would be more independent and investigate members of Congress for wrongdoing. How has it been doing? Well, um, they're a little bit stymied in their, uh, in their abilities to do work because they don't have any subpoena power. And then all they can do is do the investigation and forward it over to the Ethics Committee for further action. And the Ethics Committee has been slapping them back pretty regularly lately. So I think that the Office of Congressional Ethics is trying to do its job, um, making an effort to hold members accountable, while the Ethics Committee is really interested in covering up for members' misconduct. So what does all of this mean as far as how affairs are conducted here in Washington? Well, I, I think it's pretty much of a mess. Uh, the Ethics Committee um, gives cover to members of Congress for wrongdoing. We just saw this in the whole uh, Karib News um, investigation as well as in the PMA investigation. Uh, in both of those matters, the Office of Congressional Ethics had forwarded information to the Ethics Committee for further action, and uh, the Ethics Committee really didn't take action. They took action only against one member in the Karib News, uh, Charlie Rangel, uh, totally letting four other members who were equally culpable off the hook. And even then, Rangel was only uh, lightly admonished uh, and found not responsible because it was really his staff who knew what he was doing. Um, and then on the PMA matter, although the Office of Congressional Ethics had said two members should be investigated further, uh, Representatives Visklosky and Tia Hart, the, office, uh, the House Ethics Committee decided not to investigate them further and just let them come back to the Ethics Committee with their lawyers and say, I didn't do anything wrong. And that was really the end of the matter for the Ethics Committee. Phone number's on the bottom of the screen for Melanie Sloan. She'll be with us for about 30, 35 more minutes. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, Independents will get more specific on uh, ethics and uh, especially uh, earmarks, but wanted to let the viewers know a little bit more about this Office of Congressional Ethics. Again, it's separate from the Ethics Committee in the House, but here's a, a lineup of the board members. You'll see Congressman, or former Congressman uh, David Skaggs as chairman, and then former Congressman and former CIA Director Porter Goss as the co-chair. As we look at the other names, uh, 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 Melanie Sloan, tell us more about the makeup of this uh this, this office? Well, the board is a distinguished uh, panel. It also includes Abner Mikva, who uh, is a former congressman, a former judge, and a former White House counsel. So all of the people on the, uh, on the board are, are very distinguished, and they have uh, a staff director, Leo Wise, who's a former Justice Department prosecutor who's very well respected. How would you change things, uh, both with this office and the Ethics Committee, uh, moving forward? Well. First, there really has to be a change in attitude in Congress. It has to be that members of both parties really care about ethics, and, and they care about the ethics of the members of their own party, and they don't just use ethics as a weapon against the other party. I think that's the main thing you need. But then I think the Office of Congressional Ethics needs to have subpoena power, and I think that the House Ethics Committee needs to be forced to take what the Office of Congressional Ethics does and, and move forward with it. I don't think they should be re-reviewing all of the material that the Office of Congressional Ethics has already gone through and come to conclusions on. Does the office have a, a, a term of, of, of life? Is it a couple of years or is it just a permanent? No, it doesn't have a, a term of life, but I, I think there will be reauthorization for its funding uh, next Congress, and um, the rules could change regarding what it can do and what it can't do. Members will have to vote on those uh, each Congress. So there, there's a lot of controversy over the office, and there have been members of Congress who really don't like the Office of Congressional Ethics and want to see it go away. They say the Ethics Committee can handle matters, but I think what they're really saying is uh, they don't like that the, eth the Office of Congressional Ethics is so much tougher on members than the House Ethics Committee. But can you see a situation where the this office does get subpoena power at some point? Uh, I think that's wishful thinking. As much as I'd like to see them get subpoena power, I don't think they'll get it because in reality, I don't think Congress wants to give the Office of Congressional Ethics that much power and authority. A little bit more about the House itself. Before we get to calls, uh, several stories in the paper, including this one, House Democrats seek to limit uh, earmarks is the story. It's uh, Paul Kane 
It's the second page of the Washington Post. They say seeking to reclaim the reform mantle amid a series of scandals, Democratic leaders in the House are advocating a move that would shake up the multi-billion dollar practice of awarding no-bid contracts known as congressional earmarks. They're pushing for a new rule that would most likely forbid earmarked expenditures to private for-profit contractors for at least one year. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means they're talking about a moratorium on earmarks because they're afraid that earmarks is going to be a major campaign issue in the midterm elections. Let's hear from Valdosta, Georgia. Scott, Democrat from Melanie Sloan. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Fine. Go ahead, please. Yeah, just a comment. You know, I was a substance abuse counselor in a prison system for quite a number of years. We took ethics courses constantly because that's just what you need to do. If Congress can't set an example for the American people to follow with regard to ethics, how are the citizens supposed to do it? No, I agree not. with you completely. I, I, in fact, I couldn't agree more. I think we have a right to hold members of uh, Congress to high ethical standards. Uh, they are supposed to be role models for our children, and, and in fact, quite often their, their conduct is embarrassing and, and shameful. The uh, roll call story this morning goes beyond members to staff. There is this story at the bottom of the front page of roll call. Crits attended meeting on earmark project. Let me read a little bit to you and then you can respond. Mark Critz is the name in the piece. Uh, the aide to the late Congressman John Murtha, who was picked as the Democratic candidate to replace his boss, attended a 2005 meeting of defense contractors and lobbyists and offered the Congressman support for an earmark project that ended in the criminal convictions of three men last year. Now, according to documents obtained by roll call, Air Force lawyers discouraged military officials from attending the meeting, arguing it was an inappropriate mixture of lobbying and congressional contracting interests, though it is not clear that Critz knew about these reservations at the time. Talking here about that mix between lobbying and, um, and uh, contracting interest. Uh, speak more about this issue, if you could. Well, that, that's certainly been a problem, and this is uh, something the Office of Congressional Ethics was considering when it did its report on the PMA group, the PMA group being a, a former lobbying shop that lobbied mostly for defense contracts, uh, and they lobbied defense appropriators. And the Office of Congressional Ethics found that uh, routinely companies who were lobbying thought that the campaign contributions they made did, in fact, uh, influence their ability to get earmarks. Uh, now, the House Ethics Committee let all the members of Congress off the hook for this and said uh, there's ne not necessarily a connection between the campaign contributions and earmarks, but they noted uh, that their um, members of Congress are aware that lobbyists and trade associations believe there's a connection, and members admit that it's, it's not really in their interest to discourage that view. So at the very least, they're creating an appearance problem, if not an actual problem. And, and I would argue, of course, that there is an actual problem. If you, whenever members say that there's no connection between the earmarks and the campaign contributions. The reason you know that's true is you only have to look at who's getting campaign contributions from whom. All the defense appropriators are getting uh, uh, campaign dollars from defense contractors. You're not seeing defense contractors give their money to people on the Agriculture Committee, for example. So why are they giving all that money? They're giving it because it's a great investment and they're getting something back. Cumberland, Maryland, Philip, Independent for Melanie Sloan. Welcome. Okay, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my issue has a little bit to do with ethics and a whole lot to do with uh, the every time they talk about health care, uh, Medicare, and Social Security is brought into it in one way or another. Uh, since 1935, when Social Security was first instituted, the government has borrowed in excess of $9 trillion from Social Security. They should be made to pay that money back. I don't know where they're going to get it, but I think that that's what they should be made to do. Let's go to Coon Rapids, Minnesota now. Evelyn, Republican from Melanie Sloan. We're talking ethics and uh, earmarks here. Uh, yeah, I was uh, calling to say that, first of all, I totally agree with that guy that uh, just was on the, uh, on the TV or mm -hmm. talking <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the ethics and paying us back to Social Security, but uh, I originally called in to say that uh, to the lady, what is her name again? Melanie Sloan is her name. Melanie, um, that I was wondering why, if you guys are for uh, so much for the ethics of uh, uh, Congress and stuff like that, how come is it you didn't hold the Congress accountable for uh, all the illegal votes they took to keep torture in uh, check in? in Iraq and also the defense contractors continuing to steal our money and murder our uh, soldiers in Iraq. Anything to say there, Melanie Sloan? 
Uh, CREW is really an, an ethics organization that focuses on violations of house ethics rules and uh, um, things like that. This is sort of a little bit outside of our bailiwick, but I, I do believe that there are plenty of groups who have been very interested in what members of Congress have been doing on these other issues that the caller mentioned, and uh, I recommend you particularly to the American Civil Liberties Union for those issues. How and when was CREW started? CREW was started in 2003, in February of 2003, and we were started because there seemed to be uh, a lack of... Uh, members were not being held accountable for their conduct and particularly at that time I was focused on uh, former majority leader Tom DeLay who was probably one of the most corrupt members to ever walk through the halls of Congress and he was going unchecked for uh, for many years and uh, when crew uh, came into being we were able to write an ethics complaint that former representative Chris Bell from uh, Texas filed with the House Ethics Committee breaking a long-standing truce whereby both parties have agreed not to file complaints against the, uh, members of the other party. How is CREW funded? CREW is funded by uh, private donations and um, uh, also by some uh, 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 I'm blanking. Uh, <laughs> uh, mostly by uh, private donations, and um, many people uh, visit our website, citizensforethics.org, to contribute there. Our guest has a law degree from the University of Chicago. Melanie Sloan uh, served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia, where from uh, 1998 to 2003 she tried cases before uh, do uh, dozens of judges and juries. She's worked on committees chaired by um, uh, or led by John Conyers, uh, Joe Biden at different times. And she takes a call now from Norwich, New York. It's a Democrat, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. What would you like to um, say about yes, ethics? I want to first want to say that I think that your guest is awesome. I've seen her on some other programs, and I think she's somebody with a lot of character and a lot of uh, a lot of scruple. But um, I wanted to ask her um, if the public has um, has access to the ethics committee to make a complaint about, you know, um, something that they see that's going on in the government or something they feel that should be investigated. I also um, would like to ask her um, how to contact them because I've been trying to find that out. And also, I'd like to know if, um, if, uh, if, if there's been any um, investigation on the Stupac um, problem with the C Street and the uh, six hundred dollars rent he was able to pay and having the uh, the uh, um, the family uh, uh, religious cult there paying for his um, expenses in the C Street house and also um, um, I thought that religion wasn't supposed to get into our politics and I'm wondering why um, that these senators are able to in um, put their views on certain matters in politics and uh, be able to get away with it. Several Thank points there. If uh, someone knows or hears of something, they can contact this Office of Ethics and the Ethics Committee in the House? No, they can't actually file with the House Ethics Committee. Uh, uh, that's one of the problems with the Ethics Committee. Only members can file against each other, and, and they won't do it for the most part. Um, where uh, the caller and other, uh, other people can file is actually with the Office of Congressional Ethics. Uh, they will accept complaints from the, from the general public. Um, and as for the C Street matter, uh, Crew is, in fact, looking into that and uh, agrees with you that if Bart Stupak was indeed paying only $600 a month in, in rent for many years, uh, that may well violate the gift rules uh, of the House Ethics Committee, so we're going to be looking at that. How many people work at CREW? Uh, there are about uh, 13 people at CREW, and then we have two people in a Colorado office. How many members of the House or Senate um, are, are under some kind of um, uh, investigation or, or, or probe or on a list, both at this Office of Congressional Ethics and, and the Ethics Committee over in the House? What's your sense? Um, well, I can't remember off the top of my mm -hmm. head. We actually keep this uh, information on our website mm -hmm. at Crew, but I, I think it's at least 15 or so right now. Is that a high number to you? Uh, I don't think that's a terribly high number. Look, most members of Congress are good people who came to Congress to do a good job because they really care about the problems facing our country. But there are uh, some outliers who really engage in misconduct, and I think the real problem here is that uh, the other members of Congress are not quick to condemn those members and separate themselves and say these are not the kind of people we want leading our country. Ocala, Florida. George, Republican for Melanie Sloan. Hi. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'd like to speak to... Um voluntary charity and ethics it seems that a lot of people due to the recession now are not donating to charity so i started one and i send fishing rods to barranco belize st joseph school b-a-r-r-a-n-c-o and uh, these kids are so poverty stricken but when they get a fishing rod they can feed uh, their school program and also their family so uh, if anybody wants to send anything it's barranco belize simple address 
do you think about voluntary charity has that taken on, uh, you know, in an ethical sense? And that's my question. Thank you very much. Something you can speak to? Uh, that's really, uh, again, a little outside our, our bailiwick, but obviously it's, it's terrific when Americans uh, are, are concerned about their fellow men and, uh, and work to assist them. Let's try Kokomo, Indiana. Darren, independent from L.N.A. Sloan. Morning. Morning. Um, I've got a five-point plan, basically, to, to, that I believe would uh, repair America, and part of that has to do with uh, ethics. So I'll make it quick. Um, but the, the first point is um, we need to bring all of our troops home not just uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but everywhere, all of our military bases, close them down, bring them home, which would save us trillions of dollars. Um, we need to get out of all the trade agreements, this is the second point, and their new trade agreement should be if you sell it in America, it needs to be built in America. We need all of those manufacturing jobs. Caller, can you get us over to the topic of the segment, ethics? Yes, uh, we need more voting. Um, we need to put the people in power a lot more when it comes to the things like the health care bill and all that. When you say more well, voting, what do you mean? Uh, we need more like special elections, um, basically, like instead of having to wait every two years to vote, when it comes to like a health care bill as big as they're putting out, that needs to be put in our hands. We can't have 500 people holding up uh, America, you know, when they can't agree with each other. Advocating some changes in the system, the way we elect. Uh, you know, I think uh, two years, you, as it is, members are constantly looking for campaign cash, uh, and, and I think if we had it, say, every year, we would never be, uh, there would never be a moment when members weren't campaigning and when they'd be focused on governing. Spend a little more time, uh, not on this Office of Ethics, but the House Ethics Committee itself, a separate entity. Tell us more about that, because you said it's broken. First of all, how is it structured? Uh, it's the only committee in the House that's completely bipartisan. There are five members from each party on the committee. Generally, they make unanimous decisions uh, so that there's no space between anybody, and they're very secretive, so we know very little about what goes on there. Um, the Ethics Committee is responsible uh, for policing the conduct of members, and in fact, they have a constitutional responsibility to do so. Uh, they investigate members for misconduct. Uh, they can subpoena members uh, and they can subpoena other people unlike the Office of Congressional Ethics which doesn't have subpoena power. And then they have the power to sanction members of Congress from something as light as an admonishment to a, a censure where somebody stands in the well of the Congress and is uh, uh, the charges against them are read aloud. And they can even uh, recommend that the Congress expel somebody. Who sits on the Ethics Committee? Well, Zoe Lofgren is the current chairwoman of the committee, and Joe Bonner from Alabama is the ranking member. You said they're very secretive, but do you have a sense of how active they are, how much work they're doing right now? Well, they certainly have uh, a number of matters before them, um, but uh, uh, how active they are is really hard to say. They take a very long time to come out with anything. Generally, it takes over a year to get the results of any investigation. And as I said, almost always they clear members of misconduct. So I have to say their track record is really not impressive. Milford, Connecticut, Linda, Democrat for Melanie Sloan. Hi there. Uh, good morning. Morning. Um, I think that um, we should have Congress pledge to have uh, their ethics committee uh, on uh, C-SPAN once a month, and that way there may be, uh, they wouldn't be so secretive. Uh, they want to hold Obama to those standards. Well, maybe they should get on board with them themselves. Uh, the other thing, too, that I think is a great impediment to more things being exposed is the fact that municipalities can charge for freedom of information uh, for copies. I filed freedom of information copies here in my town and had to pay forty nine fifty for them to print out copies. Um, it, not everyone can do that. Not everyone wants to do that. If it's freedom of information, they should not be able to charge. And one last thing that has nothing to do with you, Miss Crew, but. Uh, um, a woman called in earlier and said our representatives take an oath to God when they become uh, senators or congressmen. They do not. They take an oath to the United States Constitution, and maybe she should read it. Was there anything in that call you want to respond to? Um, I, I, 
I, I think uh, the caller made some interesting points. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act is something CRU certainly uses when we're seeking out information from the government. And uh, because we are a, a nonprofit organization, we always argue that we shouldn't pay uh, fees for our information because we are distributing it to the public. The uh, Wall Street Journal editorialized that the House, quote, the House ignores Nancy Pelosi's board of outside ethics watchdogs, this uh, office. Uh, what's your take of how the speaker feels about the conduct, the, the operations, the effectiveness of the office? Well, of course, I don't want to speak for Nancy Pelosi. Sure. She's certainly capable of speaking for herself. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's interesting that the House Ethics Committee has very publicly slapped down mm -hmm. the House, uh, the Office of Congressional Ethics on a couple of occasions uh, in regard to an investigation of a member from Maryland, uh, Pete Star from California, Pete Stark, who had a property tax issue in Maryland. The Office of Congressional Ethics found Mr. Stark had engaged in wrongdoing. And uh, the, office, uh, the House Ethics Committee uh, not only cleared Mr. Stark, but they also were very insulting to the Office of Congressional Ethics about the uh, investigation that they had uh, undertaken quite publicly. And I find it very odd that uh, the two offices would have such a public spat. And it's really by the House Ethics Committee. The Office of Congressional Ethics doesn't respond to those kind of uh, charges, but the Ethics Committee so publicly goes after the Office of Congressional Ethics. And you really have to wonder why Speaker Nancy Pelosi would allow that, given that the Office of Congressional Ethics was really something that was one of her ideas, and she formed it, and sh she wanted it to be successful. At least that's what she told us. And if that's true, why would you allow the, other, the Ethics Committee to s disparage it so publicly? We've read that the Office of Congressional Ethics uh, does doesn't have subpoena power. We've discussed that. We've also read that uh, two members of the House, Peter Vesklosky and Todd Tiard, uh, at one point refused to talk to uh, investigators. Can you can you explain what that was all about? Sure. This is the uh, the PMA group mm -hmm. investigation that we mm -hmm. were talking about, and the investigation was whether members were earmarking in return for campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Vesklosky, it's important to note, is also under Justice Department investigation. And so the Ethics Committee actually cleared Mr. Vesklosky, despite the fact that the Office of Congressional Ethics said the House Ethics Committee should investigate Vesklosky further. The Ethics Committee took what the Office of Congressional Ethics did and then did absolutely nothing further. They didn't interview another person. And Mr. Vesklosky never spoke to the Ethics Committee or the Office Office of Congressional Ethics Committee, and yet he's been cleared. And I think it's odd that the House Ethics Committee has um, uh, basically a, a lower standard of conduct than the, the Justice Department does. The Justice Department thinks there's possible criminal charges, and the Ethics Committee didn't even wait to see what justice will do on Visglaski before saying, no, we know he didn't do anything wrong. Back to calls. Uh, Carolyn from Ruston, Louisiana. Carolyn is a Republican. Hi there. Hello. How are you today? Fine. Go ahead, please. Um, I would like to talk about the fact that I believe that her ethics committee is kind of like the UN, kind of neutered. And Nancy Pelosi was supposed to drain the swamp, and I think we still have swamp animals out there uh, in the Congress, and it makes it very dysfunctional. And about the other callers saying, we think that the Ethics Committee should be on C-SPAN because of Barack Obama's being forced to put on C-SPAN. It was Obama's idea to be everything on C-SPAN. So um, I wish and pray that someday you will be unneutered and able to do your job uh, that you want to do and not, it, it should be, you should be an entity that that is almost like a judge and lawyers and put these things on C-SPAN or on TV somewhere so we can know and understand what you're, the people need to know and understand who it is you're going after, why you're going after them, what they've done wrong, so we'll know. If, no, if, if, it, if all this secrecy is the problem. Let's hear from our guest. I agree with you. There really is too much secrecy uh, surrounding the, the ethics issues. Uh, I think the reason behind it is uh, the Ethics Committee feels they need to operate in secret so that if they're clearing members of Congress uh, of allegations, uh, members shouldn't be tarred by mere allegations if they haven't done anything wrong. The problem is that when we know so little about what's going on, uh, we suspect that they are just whitewashing everything. And then when we see the reports that they are issuing, which are uh, really quite pathetic when, they, when you go back and look at the Office of Congress 
congressional ethics work on the PMA uh, investigation, the Pete Stark investigation, and the Kareem News investigation. And then you see that the Ethics Committee has, in response to that, cleared everybody, it's, uh, except for Charlie Rangel. It, it really is uh, it's hard to understand, and, and their, um, their behavior really defies logic. And I think all the secrecy surrounding it contributes to that. Savannah, New York, is uh, calling now, independent. Paul, good morning. Good morning. Um, the question I have for Ms. Sloan is, how does she feel about, well, a couple of questions. How does she feel about the current, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision on campaign finance? And also, is she able to shed any light on the current Eric Massa situation? And are, are people vetted for the committees that they're on? Thanks. Sure. Um, uh, the uh, Eric Massa situation is clearly blown up and is, uh, is quite a, a mess right now. It looks like Mr. Massa has engaged in pretty serious misconduct. And uh, it's rare that crew gives uh, members of Congress any credit for doing the right thing, but Steny Hoyer really did, the majority leader, when he first learned of these allegations. He gave uh, the staff member who came to him from Eric Massa's office uh, 48 hours and said, you know, either you report this to the House Ethics Committee or I will. And so he took a firm stand that this was a matter that required immediate uh, investigation. And now, given all the allegations that Mr. Massa is making uh, about uh, some full-fledged conspiracy to kick him out over health care, uh, it seems to me that it would be appropriate for the Ethics Committee to release some report telling us all the facts behind the Massa situation so we can, so we the public can really make up our own minds about that. You think that would or could happen? Um, I, you know, that would be unusual for the Ethics Committee, but I think Mr. Massa has gone so far. Uh, if he had just resigned quietly, uh, the matter would have been over and he would have saved himself and his family a great deal of embarrassment. Uh, and we've read in this morning's papers that there are some pretty serious allegations against him that's not just about the salty language he was first claiming, but involved actual groping of male staffers. Uh, and any kind of sexual harassment is, is completely unacceptable, and I'm glad that Mr. Hoyer took that stand. Uh, but I think the Ethics Committee, given Mr. Massa's uh, uh, incredible remarks, sh should, come, should be public, and we should get the full story here. Caller asked about the Supreme Court as well. Right. The Citizens United decision, obviously a very troubling decision, and is going to have great implications in Congress. I mean, when there's problems now with the concept of campaign contributions traded for legislation, we're going to see that even more in the future now that these uh, Corporations are going to be able to use their treasury funds to run ads for and against other members. I think you're going to see members of con Congress really um, shaping their message and their, their votes to make sure that they don't anger certain companies or that they make friends with companies who can uh, pay for the campaign ads for them. From the uh, editorial page of uh, USA Today, their view, House ethics enforcers leave Congress mired in the muck is the headline to that uh, editorial. They write that sadly there is nothing new about ethically challenged lawmakers or ethics committees that act more as enablers than policemen. The solutions too have been obvious for a long time. The House needs an OEC, Office of Congressional Ethics, with real investigative powers, an ethics committee that actually cares about ethics, uh, and a speaker willing to stand up for strict rules when powerful members get caught breaking them. Until honest, ethical members take a stand, the sleazy behavior so accepted on Capitol Hill will continue to tar them all. We'll have another viewpoint in a second. Jerick Overmont in the meantime. Ron, Democrat, hi there. Hi. Good morning, uh, Melanie. Uh, I, I have two questions. My first question is, uh, aren't you doing um, the job of the free press in the country? It's kind of like more an indictment of our free press system <laughs> that you're active than anything else. Um, and I, I was just wondering if, if somebody, you know, um, tattletailed on a congressman or whatever, do you have the power to protect your sources like the free press and my second question is do you consider violations of the logan act uh an ethics issue and have you uh have you championed any kind of uh um indictment uh for people who violate the logan act 
two points there. Why don't we start with the second one? What is the Logan Act? You know, uh, it's something I remember learning about in law school, but I, I can't remember now. So clearly we're not focused on the Logan Act over at CRU. Um, so uh, I'm sorry that I can't speak to that. Protecting sources, he also asked about. Sure, CRU uh, can certainly protect sources if, uh, if members of the public want to come to us with uh, information that they may have about wrongdoing by members of Congress or the administration. We're always interested in hearing that, and we can protect, uh, protect our sources and see what we can do to develop that information further and, um, and, and push it forward. More from USA Today. Michael Capuano, Democrat from Massachusetts, the congressman who headed a bipartisan task force on ethics enforcement, writes, in his view, the ethics process is working. We'll read a little bit there before we go back to calls. Some claim the ethics panel's actions on some of the most widely reported cases weren't strong enough, but few could dispute that thorough reviews are being conducted. I don't agree with every Supreme Court decision, but I know the judicial process is respected, and it's working. Now the same can be said of the House ethics process. Are there still reforms the House could act to improve the system? Undoubtedly, and I know we will continue moving forward forward on that front, but to imply that Democrats haven't kept our promises to clean up the swamp ignores reality and distorts our accomplishments. The system in place in Congress today shows that we've come a long way and we're dedicated to getting this right. Any thoughts, Melanie Sloan? Well, uh, Mr. Capuano was the primary person in charge of creating the Office of Congressional Ethics. He was charged with that by Nancy Pelosi, so he has a lot to defend there. Um, but, I, you know, I think he's wrong. I think that they had some uh, good intentions, but they didn't give the Office of Congressional Ethics the power that it needed to be successful. And there we are. We have the mess we have now. Carol is on the line now from Winnetka, California. Welcome to the program. Carol is a Republican. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. One of the callers just called in and, and mentioned the, the press. What I'd like to uh, give out a tiny URL is tinyurl.com forward slash you didn't hear it. And speaking about ethics, um, what kind of ethics is it to send billions and billions of dollars every year, which is supporting the criminal acts and war crimes of Israel and what they're doing to the Palestinians? And I'd like to mention, too, to C-SPAN and all the callers, there's a group out there. If you go to camera.com, and there's two Zionists on there, and they're monitoring our calls to make sure they're not anti-Semitic. Melanie Sloan, is there anything there you want to talk about? Well, that seemed like a pretty anti-Semitic remark mm -hmm. from the caller, and uh, mm -hmm. I, all I can do is condemn that kind of, uh, that kind of uh speech, so uh, I have nothing else to say about it. We are going to move on. James, independent caller, Hazlitt, New Jersey. Good morning. Uh, good morning, guys. Number one, they weren't anti-Semitic comments. Guys, I, I, I'm very disturbed about the comments and, and the, the speeches that John Roberts ha has been given lately. He seems, you know, the greatest fear about this guy is he would begin to legislate from the bench, and that seems to be exactly what's happening here. Now, I've got zero love the current administration. But I also am, am politically aware enough that it, it's kind of like it, it's loaded when, the, when someone on the Supreme Court begins to work against an administration. It's not that they're supposed to be silent. Is there, is, I'm pretty positive there's no group that can legitimately look at the Supreme Court, including yours. Melanie Sloan. Well, that's right. The Supreme Court, uh, that's one of the things about being a Supreme Court justice. You're appointed for life. Uh, um, and uh, groups do, of course, monitor the courts. There are, there are many groups that, that, uh, that talk about what the Supreme Court is doing and, uh, and monitoring it, but you're, you're correct that there's nothing to be done. The courts ha have ultimate independence. Back to the two entities we've been talking about, House Ethics Committee. Do members there have a specific term? Um, I think that they do, although truthfully I can't remember how long it is. Uh, no member, by the way, wants to be on the House Ethics Committee. It is considered quite a punishment. It doesn't uh, do anything for you in your, your district, uh, and members don't like to sit in judgment of their colleagues. So it's a pretty unpopular position, and often you're rewarded later for having, uh, for having sat there. You get something, uh, a, a better committee assignment. How about the OCE? those members? Um, the OCE board, uh, I am not sure how long each of those people are appointed for. The staff director is just an open appointment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if OCE board members decide that they're interested in staying, given uh, how ineffective they've, uh, they're proving to be, uh, not because of any fault uh, of their own, but because the Ethics Committee refuses to act on the information they provide. And again, remind us, who appoints the members of the uh, OCE? Um, both uh, uh, 
Speaker Pelosi and uh, Majority Leader Boehner each get to, uh, Minority Leader Boehner each get to appoint people to that board. There were the names one more time, led by David Skaggs and Porter Goss, the former congressman, members of the House. Prescott, Arizona, Jack, down to our last couple of calls, uh, Democratic line. Hi, Jack. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN, and Melanie, thank you for your efforts of trying to get uh, some of the truth out there. Uh, I want to say that the Ethics Committee shouldn't be a part of the House, and it should be a citizen organization, and they should have subpoena power and everything else, and when they've got enough evidence, they should be able to take it directly to, this, to uh, the justice system and let it be handled like any other thing. And the members should be infor informed about all the rules, and they should come up with a law that Congress members must report violations that they become aware of, or they'll be considered guilty of aiding and abetting. But keep up the great effort, because the public really should have to know, but this good old boy system of you don't tell on me because I'll tell on you, it's uh, a losing thing that will never change until they take the committees out of uh, Congress. Melanie Sloan. Well, I, I agree with the caller that this is the reason the Office of Congressional Ethics was formed, because uh, the Ethics Committee made up of House members was considered, you know, they're too chummy with each other, with, and, and they don't want to sit in judgment of their colleagues. So that's the goal of the Office of Congressional Ethics, to be that independent body. And I think they're trying to do the best they can uh, with the limited resources and powers that th they have. One last uh, voice, one last caller from out there. It's Robert, independent from Belmont, North Carolina. Welcome. Good morning. Morning, sir. Uh, like, thank you for C-SPAN and mm -hmm. your guest. Uh, the Ethics Committee is pretty much just like Congress itself. You got 545 people, and all they do is cooperate with each other, regardless of their party, to get done what they want to do. And as far as ethics go, right now I've got a list of 29 domestic violence cases, seven fraud cases. 19 for bouncing checks, 117 members that have bankrupt at least two companies, three have done time for assault, 71 cannot even get a credit card, 14 arrested for drugs, 8 for shoplifting, 21 are current defendants in lawsuits, and 84 in drunk driving. What kind of ethics is that? Final thought on the ethics process here in Washington. Well, I, I think we really need members to rededicate themselves to the issue uh, of ethics. You know, members really don't like this issue, but the fact of the matter is voters really care about this, and they cross party lines to vote on it. We saw this in 1994 when the Democrats lost the House, and we saw it in 2006 when the Republicans lost the House. Ethics was a critical voting issue, and if members of Congress want to impress the voters, they're going to take ethics more seriously. What is your web address? Citizensforethics.org. Or you can uh, go to our website, cspan.org, and you can find a crew through there. Melanie Sloan is executive director of Crew. It's the Citizen Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you.